we've got the technology working, great. Um, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. It's good to see so many of you here in person for, yeah, our, probably our, one of our first inaugural lectures since we've all been able to get together again. Um, I'd also like to welcome those people who are joining us online as well. Just a bit of a housekeeping before we, before we begin. Um, can you please switch your mobile phones off? Yeah, great. Um, we're not due a fire alarm test this evening. You'll be pleased to hear. So if the fire alarm does go off, can I ask you please to move as calmly as possible to one of the fire exits uh, and we will we'll meet then across the road in the car park, which is the, the fire muster point. To begin, um, I'd just like to introduce some of our guests. So we have with us Professor Todd Walker uh, and his partner, Jane. Um, Todd is the Vice Chancellor for UHI. Oh, sorry, Vice Principal. Chancellor, Chancellor Spine. Um, for, for UHI. Uh, I'd like to invite Todd forward uh, to, to introduce uh, Bhavani and her lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle and colleagues. Welcome. Uh, and thank you for finding the time this evening to listen to this uh, lecture. I suspect Babani has stood on this stage many times uh, and given lectures, but today is her inaugural professorial lecture. So welcome and congratulations to you, Babani. Uh, today is your day, this evening is your evening, and we're here to celebrate your success. So colleagues, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Bhavani Nariyam Swami to give her professorial lecture here this afternoon. Uh, Bhavani has been awarded her personal chair in deep sea ecology in recognition for her long and distinguished career in marine science and acknowledgement of that continuing contribution that she will make into the field. Originally from Kolkata, as you can see, India, Bhavani graduated with a Bachelor of Science, Joint Honours Marine Biology and Oceanography from the University of Wales in 1998. In 2001, she was awarded a PhD in Macrobenthic Ecology of the Faroe Shetland Channel from the University of Southampton. Following a fellowship at the University of Massachusetts, Bhavani joined here at SAMS UHI as a European Census for Marine Life Coordinator. Progressing to a senior lectureship in deep sea ecosystems, she became head of SAMS UHI Graduate School in 2015, a post she continues to hold today. Now, over the course of her 20-year career, Bhavani has developed an outstanding international reputation in her research into deep sea and Arctic ecosystems and more recently on the distribution and abundance of microplastics in the world's oceans. She has attracted over five and a half million pound in research funding to SAMS UHI and has collaborated with researchers across the world. As we'll shortly hear, Bhavani's research into deep sea and Arctic ecosystems specifically focuses on the impacts of biotic, abiotic and anthro anthropogenic inputs of the faunal community. She is particularly interested in the fauna that live in seamounts and banks, as well as the soft sediment found in the continental margins in all the major oceans, including the Northeast Atlantic and polar seas. Increasingly, her work has been centered around the distribution and abundance of microplastics in the oceans. The long-term fate of marine microplastics is not well known. However, it is suggested that the deep sea may be the final repository for this pollutant. Assessing the input sources, the transport routes and the life cycle of marine plastics are fundamental questions to understand the impacts of plastic pollution and ensuring adequate mitigation measures are in place both regionally and globally. Bhavani is to be commended on her passion in sharing knowledge and inspiring others. As head of the graduate school, she supports over 50 marine science research students each year. She has mentored junior female scientists on the Arctic research crews and regularly volunteers as a STEM ambassador, promoting science, technology, engineering and math subjects to local school children. 
Bhavani's deep sea and microplastics research has been shared at international conferences, in academic journals and throughout publications such as National Geographic and The Guardian. The findings have informed policy makers, governments, the United Nations, businesses and other fellow scientists. She is a co-founder of the Deep Sea Biology Society, set up to promote equality, diversity and inclusiveness amongst the deep sea community. And she is a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology and a member of the UN General Assembly World Ocean Assessment, amongst other professional relationships. I'm sure you will agree with me, Bhavani is a star. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please make welcome Professor Narayana Sami. Thank you very much, Todd. Thank you all for coming. Um, I don't think I need to say any more. Todd has given what I was going to say in my lecture today, so we can all go home. But thank you once again. And I'm delighted to see so many people here. Um, it's nice to be back face to face. And um, and also, I'm very conscious there are people online. So hello to all of you online and thank you for dialing in uh, wherever you may be. So my talk today is going to be about travellers' tales. I travel a lot whether it be for pleasure or for work. Um, and I started my life in Kolkata in India and I've ended up working in the deep sea primarily. And I've ended up here on the west coast of Scotland. So for those of you who are unsure, this is the, the River Hooghly that goes through Kolkata, through the west, through West Bengal. Um, at first glimpse, these look a bit like vegetation, but it's actually lots and lots of houses alongside the sea. My mum and dad, when I was little, would take me for a walk every weekend along the banks of the Hooghly from here. Um, it was the thing that we always used to do every Sunday. Um, and you can see the numbers of boats that are, that are plying the waters here. And we would go and look at my favourite boats, Jyoti boat, Samadra boat, um, apparently, which I love to go and see every week. Um, and of course, there was the obligatory ice cream at the end of the, of the journey. So for those of you that are unsure, this um, Winter, sorry. The red star again shows how nervous I am because I can't find it. There we go. The red star there, as you can see, is where Kolkata is uh, in um, northeast India, in West Bengal. Uh, it lies on the Bay of Bengal, and from there, also um, headed north with my parents to the town of England to Sussex. Uh, before heading again, much to my parents' dismay, I think to Bangor. And finally settling here uh, in Oban. I think they're still slightly concerned because I don't do well with cold and I don't do well with wet either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for those of you that have been taught by me and I can hear the groans already, uh, I can see Eleanor in the audience, participation time, Eleanor. <laughs> so what do you think of uh, when you hear the term deep sea? I'm not kidding when I say it's participation. Eleanor, you've done no anything else? What, what else do we find in the deep sea? What's it like? There's another student, Ivan. Worms. Yes, lots of worms. So, think about the environment. It's bomb. It's dark. There's not much food. And there's increasing pressure. This is written in a book, which I'll come to in a bit. But a colleague and a great friend of mine, Natalie Sampetti, came up with this little cartoon here to try and illustrate what the deep sea left. So imagine okay, that you are somewhere cold. Pressure, you've got an elephant sitting on your head. And by the time you and the elephant are in the fridge, there's not much space, is there? So there's not much space for any food. So there's little food. And when you shut the door on the fridge, it goes dark. That's what the deep sea is like. So that's sort of an analogy of what the deep sea is like. And this is a lot of what I've been doing. Anyway, moving on. So my interest in science, this is my son here. He's a bit bigger now, sat in the front, um, is stemmed back from when I was very small. And I had a fantastic science teacher who really inspired me to undertake science. And alongside that, I was very keen to become a doctor, but not the doctor I am now, but a medical doctor. I wanted to be a paediatrician. I had my sights set on this from probably since the age of five. Um, I went to college, I went to Chichester College, 
and they had a program where you could spend 16 weeks uh, shadowing the local doctors in the local hospital. And so I loved it. I went along every week. Um, and then somebody came along to college and gave a talk about the degree that they were doing in uh, Liverpool in marine biology. And literally overnight, I changed from wanting to do medicine. I had this light bulb moment. I changed from doing medicine to wanting to become a marine biologist. So out went all the UCAS forms and all the prospectuses back then. Prospectuses actually were physical things, not things you could look online. And um, I said to my mum and dad, I want to do marine biology. And all credit to them, they supported me 100% in this sudden change of what I wanted to do. Um, and that's what I was heading off to do was marine biology. As I finished my A-levels, um, a colleague of my mum's, my mum I should say is a teacher, um, found an article in the Times Higher Education Supplement about uh, an institute called the Institute of Oceanographic Sciences Deakin Laboratory, which is here in Surrey. Uh, it's a long way from the sea. And to this day, I'm still puzzled as to why you would put a big oceanographic centre a long way from the sea. So my mum and dad and this teacher encouraged me to write to this person here, who's head of division, Martin Angel, to say, any chance of doing some work experience with you? And Martin wrote back and said, yes, come up for an interview. So as all good students do, you prep for an interview. And off I went. And my interview entailed, why do you want to do marine biology? And come and have a look around the lab. And when do you want to start? And that was it. So I was um, employed, shall we say, for six weeks to go and sort samples, interestingly, collected from the Indian Ocean. So it was my first link back to working in that area. And I was looking at shrimps and fish and jellies, um, and I had a great time. But it wasn't really kind of what I wanted to do. And as my six weeks stint came to an end, the deep sea team, this wonderful crew here of Tony Rice, Mike Thurston, Andy Gooday and Brian Vett, uh, who will kill me if they see this photo, um, said, would you like to come and work with us? We've got some work that we need doing, come and work for perhaps another six weeks. I uh, said, so yeah, okay, why not? Um, and so that's where my passion in the deep sea started. And so I started looking at deep sea photographs. They were collected from down here off the southwest coast of the UK in a place called the Porcupine Abyssal Plain about four and a half thousand meters and I was asked to look at every photograph now these aren't digital photos I should point out if you imagine old negatives but they're positives and they're reflected on a screen it was locked in a darkened room and I had to record every animal that I saw and then um, quantify the amount of this greenish material flocculent material organic matter uh, known as phytodetritus um, that I could see in every image it was a time-lapse camera, so photos were taken anything between every four and eight hours, and the time period was about 18 months. So I did that for images that were collected in 1991, 90, 92 and 94. Um, and then colleagues and friends looked at later photos that were collected in the late 1990s and into 2000. So you can see in this graph here, I had quite a lot of organic material in the photographs I was looking at. Uh, and not much was being collected in the trawls in terms of fauna. However, when my colleagues were looking at it a later, almost a decade later, there was nothing really to be seen. But there was a lot more individuals. Doesn't quite make sense. There was no change in, uh, the, foot, in the material that was coming from the water. Um, there were no changes in the midwater processes. What was happening was particularly this animal here, Amparima rosea, was hoovering up all this material before we could actually see it in the photographs. And this was then later termed the Amparima event. So my stint at IOS finished and I went up to spend three years um, in Bangor in North Wales. Um, this picture here is very different to what I remember it to be like. I think I need to go back and visit. Um, I did a lot of taxonomy there. I really had a great time. And I was very fortunate that I was able to continue my links with IOS and I undertook my dissertation, um, still looking at those photographs. Um, and that's what we actually have here. Some of our students do the same. They go elsewhere and do their projects. So I finished my degree uh, in Bangor and I was very keen to continue in marine science, particularly in deep sea ecology. And 
I ended up here. Now this is the building that you all know now, but the building I know is this bit here. So if you at the end of this session go out of this door at the back and turn right, that is the old building. That's the original building um, of Sam's and very different to what it looks like now. So there was a PhD going here. I applied, I was awarded it. And I came to work with these two fine gentlemen, uh, John Gage here, who was based at SAMS, and Paul Tyler, who was at the University of Southampton, to look at the macrofauna from the Ferris Shetland Channel. Macrofauna, small beasties live in the mud. That's what I'm really interested in. But I was also very fortunate that Brian was also part of that team uh, in an unofficial capacity. He was looking uh, and, and leading the surveys from which my samples were going to be coming from. So within the first six months of um, coming here to do my PhD, I was going on a cruise. It's great. I told my friends, I'm going on a cruise. This is what they imagined I was going on. So don't forget to pack your ball gown, Barney, your nice dresses. In reality, that is what I went on for Charles Darwin. No ball gowns, waterproofs are a must. Um, and I spent about a month on board ship out in the Northeast Atlantic and coming up into the Ferris Shetland Channel. Now this black line here indicates my transect. I'm quite um, protective about it. It's my samples that are collected from here, even now, many years later. Um, and we collected 15, there were 15 stations along this transect, ranging in depth from 150 to 1,000 meters. So what's really interesting about it? Well, it's actually the changes in water mass or the numbers of water masses that we find in the channel. And you can see we have warm North Atlantic water. Oh, if I can find the red dot again. Never mind. Warm North Atlantic water moving northwards um, while we have colder water underlying it flowing towards the southwest. Just so you can see, this is the type of gear that we use and the endless mud that we sieve on board ship. I think that's all I'm ever covered in is mud and cold seawater. But it wasn't just that, it was the fact, not just the, the water masses, but the change in temperature. So um, Brian had put out a temperature logger and found that temperature in the channel could change by as much as eight degrees in the space of an hour. Now, my beasties are quite small. So imagine if I asked Rich at the back to turn the temperature down by eight degrees, you're not allowed to move, you've got to sit there. You'd get quite chilled quite quickly. But this is what these wee beasties have to put up with, these rapid changes in temperature over the space of an hour. They can't move out of it. Um, so this is, this is what caused us to be quite interested in this area. These are my wee beasties. Um, these are polychaetes. These are, are worms that live in the mud. Imagine you're gardening, you find worms living in the mud. That's what I look at, but I think these are much prettier um, than what we find on land, plus some other brachiopods and some crustaceans. Anyway, so what results did we find? Well, we were looking at abundance and biomass and finding that actually it was a bit variable between years and between stations. Didn't seem that interesting until we looked more closely at the diversity of it. And we found that the peak in diversity was highest at about 500, 550 meters, which was beginning to correlate with where we saw the greatest temperature range, where we saw the temperature changing quite rapidly. And so we were finding that we were getting both Atlantic and Arctic species at this depth range. Now, for those of you who've done identification of animals, it's time consuming, really time consuming. So I always looked into ways to see if we could speed it up. Do we really need to identify to species level or can we get away with just family level? Um, although we see similar patterns here at family level, the similarity is much lower when we look at species level. And so we felt actually we couldn't do this. We needed to, to keep identifying to a lower taxonomic level. Brian and I looked at um, whether we could look at general level and found actually uh, we could use this as a proxy for species level. I'm still not convinced actually that, that species and level and general level, there's much difference. I think they're both very difficult. Um, but that's, you know, if you are a good taxonomist, then you can use genera uh, instead of going to species level. So as I was coming uh, to, the, to the start, actually, of my postdoc, um, continuing in the Ferris Shetland Channel, John Gage was asked if he would write a paper related to the Antarctic. And based on that, he was then offered a position or a place to go on this German research vessel, the Polarstern. 
John didn't want to go. Now, who would not want to go to the Antarctic, really? So he turned around and said, Fanny, do you want to go? I said, oh, yes, please, I'll go. I'm not going to turn it down. Um, you'll have to find the money to go. So I applied for a grant and got the funding and I actually ended up going twice. I was very lucky. Um, and I spent between six, I spent six weeks and again, three months on board, on board Flashton, focusing on this area here across the Weddell Sea. Um, part of a project called um, Antarctic Deep Sea Benthic Biodiversity, looking at the colonisation and the history of the area. And it was led by um, Angelica Brandt from Germany. So this is what I look like when I'm at sea, covered in mud. We use lots of um, quite heavy equipment. Um, just to give you a flavour, I don't go in ball gowns and I don't normally dress like this. Um, it is usually quite muddy. Um, and we process lots of material. I'll come on to the data or the results in a minute, but I have to, had to slip something in here. Um, some friends who aren't scientists think that scientists are a little bit dull, a little bit boring, a little bit square. So um, I went back and I found some photos because this is before we had internet on the ship. So we had to make our own entertainment on board the ship. Now, some of you will recognize some of the colleagues, but they have been fairly well masked up. So this was the Olympics. We had the Andeep Olympics on board the ship. Oh, sorry. Uh, we have the luge, the bobsleigh, and because we're in Scotland, we have the curling. I won't mention any names, but I'm sure if you look closely, you'll be able to recognize at least one person of the professoriate team. I'll say no more. Anyway, so yes, we do have fun. We do make our own entertainment because we have nothing else to do apart from when we're working. But we also become tourists. Um, and who wouldn't be when you see humpback whales coming up to the ship? Doesn't matter that you've got equipment in the water. Doesn't matter. Just have a look. Take lots and lots of photos. How many photos can you take of a humpback whale? Thousands. Uh, penguins came on board the ship. Lots of pictures of icebergs. They're stunning. Um, this is what it looks like when you're on board ship. And just some of the scenery of how lucky I think I am to be able to go and see places like this in the name of my work. Anyway, so back to the science. We've done a little bit of a detour there. Um, when I was on board Palashden, I met this person here, Jim Blake, who was um, a taxonomist based in a company down in Woods Hole. And we got on very well. And he said, would you like to come and work with me when your postdoc finishes? Said, yeah, why not? So I spent um, several months in Woods Hole, based in Woods Hole with Jim, uh, Stacy and Izzy Williams here, looking at the samples that we had collected from the Antarctic cruises. And so this is what the material looks like from our box cores. Now there are many of us wanting this same material and John had sent me off without a remit of what to collect or who to speak to as a junior postdoc. It was pretty difficult. So I was pleased I was working with Jim and um, we collected our samples. We had 12 stations you can see across the Red LC. We had almost 240 individuals and almost 120 species. So for every two individuals we were collecting, we were adding a new species. Um, this graph here, we had to put a little bit of science in, sorry. But this graph here um, is looking at the number of expected species against the number of samples we need to collect. When it flatlines, we've collected all the species that we think we're going to get in that area. And you can see here, none of these lines from any of these stations are beginning to flatline. So we've got an awful lot more material to collect before we find most of the species we're expecting. Of the species, of the species we have, um, two stations here, um, circled in red, had the greatest similarity. That's no surprise. There were only about four species that were the same in those two stations. And it shows, therefore, how different the stations were, or how many different species we were actually finding. So there was still a lot of work to be done in, in the Antarctic. Now, Jim also introduced me into describing a new species and how to do this, because I'm quite short-sighted. When I look down a microscope, I don't wear my glasses. It's really difficult to draw these tiny beasties on a piece of paper and they look nothing like they're meant to. So he said, no, no, Pavani, you use something called a camera lucida and it projects what you see down the microscope onto a piece of paper. It's magic. It's brilliant. And so, um, we found a new species and he let me draw it, which is great for me. I'd spent many years trying to figure out how to draw. Um, 
And so we had this new species of polychaete called Orbiniella andipia, named after the andipe crete, and this is how often species are named. Anyway, so my time in Woods Hole came to an end. I came back to Oban, um, and I, I came and worked for a company called Seas, um, looking at samples that had been collected from fish farms. It wasn't really what I wanted to do, but it meant I had a job. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but there was a project officer, project coordinator job going with the European Census of Marine Life. Um, and this was a 10 year program to assess the diversity, the distribution and the abundance of marine life in the world's oceans, looking at it historically, what we could see currently and what we might see in the future. And there were 17 field programs, 12 committees, and this blue area, Europe, was my area, the committee that I was involved in. So this was my exec committee team. This is Graham Shamild, who was the chair of the European Sense of Marine Life and was also the director here at SAMS. And these were my aims of what I had to do, which was slightly daunting, which had nothing to do with deep sea biology. Um, anyway, we managed somehow to do this, um, expand partnerships, improve biodiversity, raise awareness of the census with national funding agencies, etc. And these were some of the um, workshops that we funded to try and get projects off the ground, looking at alien invasive species, tracking of predators in the Atlantic, just to name a few. But I was really passionate about the deep sea and there were five deep sea projects taking place um, through the census of marine life. And I happened to know three of the coordinators. So the coordinators had got together and were, we don't want to replicate what each other are doing in terms of education and outreach. Why don't we work together and we'll take Bhavani along for the ride because she's a deep sea biologist. And so we wrote this book, Deeper Than Light, um, had it translated into uh, French, German, Spanish and Norwegian. And it was to tell the tales of what it might be like to travel along the deep sea. We had some of these fantastic images from David Shale, um, watercolours from the Michael Sars expedition back in the early 1900s, and then later ones in 2004. And it was just to try and get people engaged in the deep sea. We also had an exhibition that travelled the world um, called Deep Sea Life. Um, and it was text from the book that we used, as well as images. And we also had some specimens here. And this was the DESIO, Deep Sea Education Outreach Team uh, in Bergen, trying to decide what we were going to do with them um, in terms of education outreach. And so very briefly, at the end of this 10 year programme, there'd been almost 3000 scientists involved from over 80 nations. A huge amount of money had been spent on it. Um, and more than 6000 plus potential new species have been found. I think that's an amazing thing to, to have done. And we're starting again in a similar vein now um, with another 10-year pro program. So Graham was, was very good to me. He allowed me to continue to do my deep sea research whilst um, being the coordinator for the European Census. And we started looking through commercial work, uh, exploring seamounts and banks in the Northeast Atlantic. So seamounts are underwater mountains. And these are some of the things that we sometimes see. So this is where we're particularly interested uh, these little blobs here are the seamounts and banks. I think they look much prettier when you see them like that. Now, audience participation again. Sorry, final one, I promise. Um, what is the tallest mountain in the UK? Yes. No. It's actually this one here, Anton Dawn Seamount. It's an underwater mountain, but it's actually taller than Ben Nevis. So pub trivia quiz question in case you get asked. Um, but it's just out here. They'll probably mark it wrong and say it's still Ben Nevis, but just so you know. <laughs> and when we, um, John and I had actually written a grant to look at the seamounts and banks, and we thought at that time, and, and information has changed, research has, has moved on so much, we thought we would find these luxurious um, sponges and corals, etc., living on the seamounts and banks. And when we went out, it was interesting, but it wasn't quite what we were expecting. We did find some, some coral, some rubble, um, and some beautiful anemones here, um, but not quite the luxuriant uh, sponge and coral reefs that we were expecting. Anyway, so that kicked, kicked off and I was able to continue my seamount research um, through another couple of programs funded by the EU and NERC, looking at three seamounts here, Senor, Ampere, and Eratosthenes in the Mediterranean. Um, unfortunately, you know, weather is always a problem when you're out in the field. 
and most of the sample or a lot of the sampling we were hoping to do on Ampere didn't take place and on, on Eratosthenes I remember Peter Lament who um, mobilized and demobilized all three cruises I was actually on maternity leave so I didn't go at all um, I remember getting a message just before Christmas going Bhavani there's nothing here I'm collecting all these mega core samples for you but there is nothing here I'm getting like one polyky if that it's really quite depressing. So we didn't actually do very much with those samples because there was nothing to look at. Anyway, uh, I had a PhD student, Adam Chivers, who came and looked at the material we did have from Senor Seamount. Um, and he focused primarily on this northern transect. And um, there were five stations from 130 to 3000 meters. And we were looking to see how the diversity and the abundance changed. And we can see quite clearly here that these summit stations are quite different from the other stations at less than 10% similarity at polychaete, with looking at the polychaete species. I get to go on another seamount expedition, this time to the Southwest Indian Ocean. However, I was still on maternity leave, so I still didn't go. Um, I've still to go somewhere nice and sunny. Um, but Peter Lamont went again for me. He's fabulous. His name will crop up quite a lot through this. Um, and Natalia Sepetti as well, um, the postdoc on that. And we were looking at these five seamounts along the ridge system here, coral in the south with Atlantis in the north. And the, and the Indian Ocean is, is one of the areas which has the largest gaps in deep sea exploration. And we were very interested in looking at the benthic communities there, at the gradient changes, particularly in ocean currents, temperature, and the primary productivity. And so coral seamount here is bathed in quite cool water, Atlantis in much warmer water. So we were interested to look at one of the things we were looking at was the uh, human impact on these benthic ecosystems um, in order to try and establish a marine protected area. In fact, coral and Atlantis seamounts had been proposed as EBSAs, ecologically, biologically significant areas, which is the first step in order to become an MPA. And you can already see the, the litter from the fishing on these seamounts. Pretty picture time. Um, these were some of the things that we did find um, on using the ROV from some of the uh, seamounts. I think this is a beautiful uh, image of a coral. If we zoom in closer, you can start to see the ophioids, the brittle stars that are all entwined in this coral. But I have to bring it back to polychaete, sorry. Um, I think they're just as beautiful. And these are the ones living in amongst the coral. See, this is quite cute with its big eyes looking at you, you know, maybe. <laughs> um, some, I think, beautiful, stunning images of them. Uh, this one's a bit scary. I think it could be used as some of the um, scary films, maybe. And this one is um, with its armour on it. But just note how small we're looking at. It's just two millimetres in length there. Uh, we also looked at the uh, various crustaceans and these here look like they've taken coral polyps and actually placed them on their back, but actually it's part of the actual exoskeleton itself. Now just keep an eye on these because these will come back up in another format later on in the talk. So we also looked at the macrofauna living within the coral, so within the framework, the rubble, etc. And what we did was we got um, dilute acid and we put the coral in this dilute acid and dissolved it to see what we could find. Um, lots of people said you won't find anything. Peter said you will. So I always do what Peter tells me to do. And we found polychaetes living within it. Um, in fact, we found over 30 polychaete families living within these different coral rubble and framework. And, you know, the numbers that we collected varied from you know, just over 30 to almost 800 individuals per kilogram of coral. So I thought that was quite, quite fascinating. Some of them have interesting tails. They're um, modified so they can actually burrow into the coral itself. I showed you earlier, there's litter out there. Now, some of these seamounts that we, I showed you are something like a weak steam from land. And it just shows how much litter is getting out, probably from fishing vessels going over it. So I came back from the Southwest Indian Ocean um, and Peter, again, um, doesn't like throwing anything away. And those of you at SAMS will know that Peter was a real hoarder, which, to be honest, I was delighted about. Um, he, we had samples that were collected primarily from here, from Station M at the foot of Anton Dawn Seamount. 
and this is what it looks like. It's very muddy. Uh, sample collection started in the early 1970s, um, stopped for a bit, and then I restarted it for a few years in 2013. And Peter, this is Peter here with the piece of kit we use. We still have this piece of kit from the mid 1970s. Peter wasn't there in the mid 1970s, but from the mid 80s. So we were very fortunate that we had the same um, researcher going out with the same piece of kit, collecting the samples year on year, making sure that they were collected properly. So what was I doing with these samples? I wanted to see whether microplastics could be found in the deep sea. Uh, so I was looking back in time and I had a student, Winnie Courtney Jones, that came and looked at them because I had this idea that if we looked historically at these samples, we would find nothing in terms of microplastics in these animals. And then we would see a, an increase in the, in the microplastic concentration. So she focused on these three species that we could definitely find in the years we were looking at. Um, so this is a brittle star, a sea star and a snail. And yes, she did find them in the deep sea, as you probably are all aware from what Todd was saying. The quantity varied between um, the individuals of each species as well as between species. Um, this brittle star here had the greatest number of polymer types, the greatest number of plastic types, um, whereas the sea star actually had the greatest number within, within its body. So we're saying about, you know, finding whether when we would see this sort of this rapid increase in the microplastics within our deep sea species. But we look back here in the early 1970s compared to 2013, there is no sharp increase. So plastics were being found way back in the 1970s before some of the smaller children here were born and some of the students, I know. Um, so, yeah, they, they've been there for an awful long time. And we also looked at the polymers. Uh, we found that acrylic and polyester were the main types of polymers actually being found out in the deep sea, both in the animals and also uh, in the sediment as well, just over here. So sticking on the theme of microplastics, I had a student, Lola Paradinas, who just finished earlier this year. Um, and I tasked her with looking at microplastics along the west and northwest coast of Scotland. Um, at the same time points. She can't multiply herself in, or divide herself into six pieces, so we use citizen scientists to help actually collect samples at all these locations. So there's a broad geographical region, um, and she was looking at samples from the seawater, from the sediment, and from the mussels over a year, so it was seasonal. Um, and you needed to come up with a kit that was going to be easy for citizen scientists to use. Um, and she did, and it worked very, very well. This is, this is the kit here, um, and it just went in a cool box. It would be posted out to them. They would collect the samples, put them in the post, and she'd get them back again, and then be able to process that material. So what did she find? She found lots of things, but I won't go into it because it's, that's a whole other seminar in itself. Um, but she found that polyester was the most abundant polymer type. Um, in all the, the fractions she was looking at, so the sea, the mussels, and in the sediment. In the seawater and in the sediment, the fibres were more prominent compared to the to fragments, whereas in the mussels, fragments were more pro, uh, prevalent than, than fibres were. Um, and this sort of work along the northwest coast and the west coast of Scotland is being looked at also by Nicole Allison, who's um, also using citizen science data from Marine Conservation Society looking at large plastic items, large littered items along the West Coast to see what they, where they are, where they're in abundance, how much is being found there. She's also looking at tracking these, so releasing particles from the Clyde and seeing where they end up. Um, and at the minute, we're finding that a lot of them are actually heading south. We thought they might head north, but at the minute, they're heading further south um, and across to Ireland. So remember I said don't throw those samples away, we were able to do one more thing with them. Uh, we were actually able to look at the fauna in these samples. I was interested to see if there was any relation to a change in climate. Um, we found changes in abundance and biomass um, across, these, across the years, particularly 1993 was a bit of an anomaly. Um, and we see here that yes, there's been an increase or fairly steady amount of um, mollusks being found 
But in 1993, for some reason, this just exploded. Still don't know why. Um, and now, more latterly, we see that that has decreased. And we have um, phytoplankton data. We've got um, hydrographic information. And what we want to try and do is pull all of this together to see if we can try and explain the differences that we're actually seeing. We also saw changes in the polychaete community. So back in 1983, when we looked at a sample, there were just 19 families found, yet in 2013, there were 33 being found. So there's a huge change. And again, we want to try and understand this a bit more. So the final part of our research, I quite like the title, it's prize. It's the, the prize of the research we've been undertaking. It's being led by um, Finlow and being uh, lots of colleagues here at SAMS are participating in this. Um, and we were looking at stations along the, in the Barents Sea, along 30 degrees east. Um, you would think when you're up in the Barents Sea, all the seawater is going to be quite cold, but we actually have warm North Atlantic water and colder Arctic water as well in this area. And Ivan Kutain um, is looking at the importance of ice algae, so algae that lives under the ice, um, and as well as phytoplankton, as food sources for the animals that are living in the, in the sediment. So what's he finding? He's got to write it up as a paper. Note to Ivan. Um, that the longer the ice duration, there's a higher proportion of sympagic organic carbon that's being consumed by these animals. So I should have said, these are some of the animals that he's looking at, that the ice algae are important um, as a source of um, food for those organisms, particularly in the northern Barents Sea. But what was going to happen um, as, we, as the climate changes and we have shorter ice cover? Are we going to have what's going to happen to those organisms that are reliant on that sympagic algae? And really, just the, to finish up, so I started off my career looking at photographs in a darkened room. Um, I'm still looking at photographs, perhaps not quite in such a darkened room. Um, again, looking at uh, photographs taken along the transect. So in the south, we find that the sediment is quite soft and we have lots and lots of crustaceans. As we move further north, we see it becomes much more rocky. There's more boulders and cobbles and therefore the fauna is changing in relation to that. So that's the end of my science bit. I've just got a couple of slides that I do need to put up there because I do try and do some education outreach when I get a chance. And um, I was asked by Tanalt Primary, that it's the school that my children go to, went to, uh, to take their, their mascot, the school bear, to the Arctic with me. So he made it up to 82 degrees north, um, looking at the view, helping me sieve samples here. Um, and I would write blogs about what we were doing once every few days. Now, we didn't have internet, and uh, the captain overheard me saying that I, you know, that I couldn't send the blogs home. The children were going to finish school before I got back off the ship. So he kindly let me send all this information, some photos back to the school so they could see what their bear had been up to. So that was one thing. The other thing I was also involved in is uh, something with Jessica Giannotti. Now I've got two Fantastic assistance. So I'm using the UHI strapline, daring to be different. So I'm daring to be different in my talk today. And I would like my two children to just come up onto the stage very briefly to just showcase what Jessica has been doing. So she's taken some of the um, beautiful, I think, samples that we've collected from the seamount. So do you remember the, the crustacean I showed you earlier? And she has transposed this onto scarves. Um, let me turn it the other way around. Yeah, that'll do. Um, and, you, and in relation to this, uh, she's putting forward, you know, the information about where they've been found, what they are, and what we as researchers have been doing to collect these samples. So I think that's fabulous. Those who are online will only see it, I'm afraid, on the screen, but those in the audience can see it live. So that was the first thing I was doing with Jessica. And then the second thing I was doing with Jessica and again with Tanalt Primary School was the school teacher, Jenny Love, got a grant from the Royal Society and I was asked to go in and talk to them about microplastics. So um, I went in, I told them about microplastics, where they were found, the damage they were doing. Um, they brought in an artist, they brought Jessica in. And what they did was the, the, the children had to draw 
and paint their own views of microplastics in the ocean and what was going to happen. They had to write a little bit about it and then they were put forward onto these notebooks. And again, my younger son is showcasing two of the uh, notebooks that were, that were produced um, in conjunction with Jessica. And I should have said Jessica was actually a student of ours here on the marine science degree. And she's very passionate about trying to bring marine science out to the general wider audience. You can sit down now. You can stop being quite so embarrassed. Thank you very much. This is pretty much the end of my talk. Um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everybody who has been a part of my life. Friends, family, colleagues, students. Um, there are many, many more people. I couldn't put everybody on here. Many, not, not only because of space, but I couldn't find all your photos. So um, there are people I know that I haven't got on here and I'm sorry, but this just gives you an idea of some of the people that have been behind me doing all of this. And I couldn't be here now without them. It's very much a team thing. And really my final thanks has to go to this team. So to my children who fabulous just got up on the stage, um, to Krishna and Nishan for putting up with mum, going away to sea, disappearing to meetings, working late. Um, to Keith, who has just been a real rock ever since I started here, um, has kept me going. And to my mum and dad, who have always, always believed in me from the very start and let me do what I wanted to do. So thank you. Thank you all very much for listening. So um, I just wanted to thank Bhavani for a really interesting, uh, that was brilliant lecture. Um, Apologies if I was over time I'm nope. trying to get through it. It's fine. So the next part is, is actually uh, opening up to questions from the audience, both online and in the room. If you're going to ask a question in the room, could you wait until you, a microphone? Yep, yeah, we've got both Anushka and Axel with microphones. Uh, it's just so people online can, can hear your questions as well. Um, I'm going to take the privilege of asking the first question. As long as it's nice. It is nice. I, I mean, what, what do you think at the moment is now the biggest challenge to um, the deep sea environment? The biggest challenge? Depends on where you're looking, but I would say if you're looking, um, I would say actually mining. The, we are looking for uh, you know, elements for our wind turbines, for our electric cars, and we are looking to mine them from the deep sea. And that is going to have a massive impact um, on, the, on the habitat and on the fauna that we find there. And I don't think we know enough yet to, to really take that forward. And there needs to be a lot of legislation in place to actually do that. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes. It's not about marine biology, but it struck me looking at that, what happened in 1993 must be so crucial to everything else. Have you got any ideas? What happened in 1993? Um, so you probably actually need to go back a little bit because what we're collecting then is from you know are the adults from what will have grown up from the previous couple of years so we probably need to go back to the to 1991 and to be honest i don't know we need to we need to look at it more closely to see whether there have you know, whether we've looked at it at quite a coarse taxonomic level and actually what we need to do is look at it at a finer level but it could be um change in the amount of organic material coming from this from the surface of the ocean it could be a change in the actual composition the type of food input coming in that has had a change that we're seeing then you know a couple of years later on the sea floor but that's something that i want to look at and you know looking forwards you know if we can take this work forwards perhaps we can link it more to to changes in the climate that we're seeing Could we, next question, got any? Ah, 
rock. Uh, awesome talk, Vani. It was re really cool to see that that whole journey. Um, but uh, actually, uh, one thing I was curious about is when you're taking your or comparing your samples throughout the years, looking specifically into the the microplastics. You said that uh, you were kind of expecting to see this big kind of sharp increase, um, but actually it seems that plastics have been there for since the early 70s. But I was curious to know, did you look into the, the, the different types of plastics, or more specifically, like, did you see more modern types of polymers start to crop up in the more recent years compared to the 70s? Now that's really put me on the spot. <laughs> you think this is a whole thesis by Winnie that I have to try and download from my memory. Um, I don't know, actually. Um, yeah, so what I showed on one of the slides was a summary of the polymers that had been found amalgamated over time. Um, I suspect that po probably polyester was, was probably one of the ones that we were finding um, really early on. <laughs> So on, online questions, the, the, the wonders of modern technology. So uh, Charles, oh, he's gone. Oh, where's Charles gone? Ah, right. So Charles Howey from Edinburgh uh, wants to know, does the deep sea have any potential for farming food species? We, we already fish in the deep sea, but the cost of doing that and whether people really want it eat it um, is phenomenal. It may be that in a century's time, that's where we may be looking. But at the moment, I doubt that that's going to take place. Um, it's just, yeah, it depends on also on where you're looking. You know, if you're looking at 4,000 metres or 1,000 metres, they're quite different. Um, but we already fish um, at, at relatively deep depths um, and those fish are collected and, and are eaten. So, Kerry Howell, um, oh, thanks, Kerry. Wants to know what is the most amazing thing you've seen, and what is the thing you are uh, most proud of? It's the most amazing thing I've seen. Lots of amazing things I've seen, Kerry. Um, I think seeing the welly boot in the Barents Sea, <laughs> uh, in the middle of no place. Um, Looking through the photographs, we found a welly boot on the sea floor, just lying there. Uh, and another one is a, unfortunately it's anthropogenic again, but um, a bright pink washing up glove on the seamounts in the southwest Indian Ocean with a little fish hiding underneath it. What was the second part of the question? Uh, what's the thing that you are most, most proud, proud of? The thing I'm most proud of. Um, I am most proud of the teams of people that I work with, both here at SAMS, nationally and internationally. Uh, people like you, Kerry, um, make it worthwhile. So, uh, and final question is from Andrew Sweetman. Uh, lovely talk, Bhavani. Have you assessed the mac maximum burial rate of microplastics, e.g. assessing the maximum depth that plastics are found, divided by the length of time plastics have been in existence. <laughs> it, it, we haven't finished yet. And comparing this to the rates of sediment accumulation derived from classic measurements, e.g. radio tr tracers, to see how they compare. Best wish wishes, Andrew. <laughs> Love you too, Andrew. Yes, we have. We looked at it in the North East Atlantic. Winnie looked at them. Um, and actually, the, the depth at which the microplastics were buried was greater than the age of when microplastics came or plastics came into existence. And that's because of bioturbation. So uh, we had looked at it, but we couldn't assess. You know, we were wondering whether we could see um, in terms of ageing when we would actually see the microplastics occurring again in the sediment. But we couldn't because they were taken down to a greater depth. If you go to another area where there's less bioturbation occurring, then yes, you would probably be able to uh, look at that, but we haven't done that anywhere else yet. Phil. Fantastic talk. Thank you, Bhavani. I know you're very keen on public understanding of the deep sea. Have you thought about how it could be uh, a place for tourism? <laughs> um, 
Um, a place for tourism. No, I haven't thought about uh, about it being a place for tourism, Phil. Um, I th there are people that are devising um, mini submarines in the States that are taking people to a certain depth. Um, and that's great if you've got the money to do so. It's very similar to, to space tourism. It will be those who can afford it that can go and see it. And I think as researchers, we um, have a duty to ensure that it's open to everybody and accessible to everybody, whether it be here in the UK um, or more globally with the research teams that we work with. Ah, great talk. <laughs> I am wondering, where do you see deep research going? Where do I see the research going? The research I'd like to do or research in general? <laughs> you and also future generations since um, there is more awareness now and new technology is improving as well. So yes and so picking up on your point about technology there is new technology absolutely and this is great for looking at the larger fauna that live on the sediment but the animals that I look at live within the sediment and so um, how how new technology I don't know yet is actually going to be be able to assess that is really challenging. We're moving towards wanting to have um, net zero carbon emissions ships uh, sending out gliders to collect information. Again, this is brilliant, but it's not going to collect the mud and the animals that I want to look at. And my concern is that we're going to just ignore that in our push for making sure that we're not taking ships out to sea. In terms of my research, I really want to take forward looking at the changes in, uh, in the times, uh, time series that I've got and trying to figure out what is causing those changes that we're seeing and to try and restart the sampling in that location. Um, not every year, but once every five years or so to see if we can detect uh, changes in the fauna over time. I think this is probably our last question. Another one from online from Stephen M. Are you able to say what impact the microplastics in the deep sea fauna is having? There's not been enough work done yet looking at the impact on the fauna. Um, for that, you really need to, I think, to be bringing uh, live specimens back and doing experimental work on them. Um, you have to then try and balance that with what have they already ingested and then feed them more microplastics to see the impact it might have. It's the sort of work you can do in shallow water. You can take organisms and feed them microplastics and see you know, whether it changes um, perhaps their reproduction amongst other things. But um, to do it in the deep sea, I think would be quite challenging. Oh, Anushka, do you have a question? Yeah, just one last question. <laughs> <laughs> you professed your love for worms. And I just thought I'll give you a chance to tell us a little bit more what it is about polychaete worms that you so love. <laughs> They're beautiful. They are, beauty is in the eye of the beholder and everyone always loves these large organisms, you know, the corals, the sponges, the bryozoans, um, because they're easy to see. You don't have to drill down that far to look at the beauty. You know, the, there was one that had um, scales over it and the light glinting on, on its kitty, so the bristles that stick out from the side of it. Perhaps not beautiful, but really striking. And I think we need to try and promote that a little bit more, that it's not just large animals that are beautiful to look at, but we need to be looking at the smaller ones as well. And this really is the final question. So Victoria Ashley Wheeler uh, wants to know, is there any possibility of using environmental DNA and metabar coding to simplify taxonomic assignment? Yes. But, but, but it won't tell you what the species is mm -hmm. and therefore it won't tell you about their feeding type or any other extra information that you need to know about the composition of that community. So yes, it will tell you that you've got 100 species, but if you don't already know what those species are, if you don't already have the DNA of those species, 
it will just tell you the species you've got. It won't give you that other information that we need. That's great. Can we once again thank Bhavani and those people who've asked questions? <laughs> It gives me great pleasure now to hand over to Professor Axel Miller, the Deputy Director for SAMS. Thanks very much, uh, Michelle and Bavani. That's such a great uh, lecture. Being a member of the UHI Crop Store myself since being awarded personal chair in 2018. Uh, and since that day, it continues to be uh, a great honour to hold the title. It's a wonderful thing to achieve, particularly in my case when it was not something I was thought to. Um, I think if Dr. Bavani's career trajectory it seems uh, pretty obvious to me that this was an end point of some sort. I first met Bavani 20 years ago, and uh, since then I've had great pleasure in watching her career develop. It's great when you see someone as an earlier career researcher. Uh, and then you stand next to them on an event like this, which is absolutely wonderful. So uh, it's it's great pleasure really being here. Uh, consequently, uh, it gives me pleasure to welcome her to the UHI Professoriate today. Uh, the term professor can mean lots of things. Uh, I think most importantly for students, uh, it gives a fount of knowledge uh, and someone to look up to, uh, hopefully someone to respect and be inspired by. And I think what we've seen today is quite clear that Bavani's career path and the way she engages with students uh, certainly uh, ticks that box importantly. Uh, for fellow academics, it defines someone who is really at the, at the head of knowledge in their game, that they really are telling us new things. It's, it's really discovering a lot more about the oceans and as one of the um, members of the audience said, you know, that we don't know much about the oceans. And so it's really important we have people like Bavani uh, who are finding new species, learning a lot more about their ecology uh, and unfortunately learning about uh, how humans are impacting on the environment. I think the final thing to say is a title professor is only awarded to highly accomplished and recognised academics. And certainly in Scotland, it's the highest level of academic uh, rank. Uh, and esteem. So uh, it's very fitting that we're here today to recognise that. Um, Professor Nariana Swami fits very well indeed into the profile. She has the international reputation for her work and she's quite elegantly morphed her love of marine biology into studying plastics in the oceans as well. But at heart, she's not that bothered about plastics. And, and thanks to Anushka's question, she's been able to explain why. Uh, it's extremely fitting that she joins a senior academic cadre of the UHI. It's an institution celebrating tremendous success. Last week, the results of the latest research excellence framework were published and UHI has done better than we've ever done before. And we've improved our rankings across the university compared to the other universities in the United Kingdom. It's because of people like Bavani and the work that they do that we've been able to achieve that. Uh, and it's a, a tremendous landmark for the university uh, to have such great people um, being recognised in that way. So we already have a professoriate of about 50 people. We've got subjects including nursing, pedagogy, engineering, history, far more. But now for the first time, I believe we can add deep sea ecology uh, to that wonderful list. So um, uh, Bavani has a first there as well. So it's my pleasure to pass on a gift from the university. I will not try and open it, but I'm just going to give it to you. Really? It is. At this point, I might get a little bit oh. So, if you'll please join me with more applause to welcome Professor Bhavani Narayana Swami to the Professoriate of the University of the Highlands. Thank you uh, very much for your participation in the evening. Uh, for all those people on the telly, bye bye. Very <laughs> sorry. Uh, but for those of you here with us, uh, there's a small reception next door uh, where we can all have a chat and, and get hugs from Bavon. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.
Sounds like I'm not a good